You're listening to audio from the Decidedly Podcast. For more information, find us on Instagram at Decidedly Podcast. So you rode bulls for a period of time. Yeah, not very well. <laughs> well, but what made you decide that riding bulls was something you wanted to do? Um, as I thought it'd be cool. And I thought that one day, probably when I'm 50, that I would think that that was cool and I would be sad if I didn't do it. And so I was like, well, you know what? I'm 18 or however old I was. Uh, I'm not going to be able to do this forever. There's going to be, I, and I, I thought at the time, Hey, there's gonna be a time where my, um, prefrontal cortex is fully developed and I realize this is dumb so I should do it now when I can't wait you were you were aware enough to know no. that it was <laughs> a bad thing <laughs> totally and that you should make it out before you decide not to <laughs> no I think that I didn't want to regret not trying it and it sounded like a really absurd challenge right because my goal was uh not just to like do it but was to be competitive in a like real regulated rodeo that was that was my um, right. Not not just like, at a friend's ranch. Not just yeah, in someone's backyard or something. Right. It was like to make it to the go round in a legitimate rodeo that people paid tickets to go see. How, how long did you do it before you made eight seconds? Oh, I mean, it was like at least a year. Yeah, it took a while, but I did ultimately complete my goal. Yeah, I'm, I'm I did several times. Com- right, competed. Um, I never won any money, but I, you know, people paid money to see me fall. Uh, <laughs> well, I, right. I consider that a win. That's a win. But it was a, it was a unique experience that taught me a lot about, um, it taught me a lot of life lessons. It taught me, yeah, Hey, I'm happy that I went and did it. Um, to do the wild, crazy things that you know that you're going to regret. Even if there's a risk associated with it. What do you mean that you know that you're going to regret? Regret, regret not if I, not, if I didn't. Yeah. Like right. I, w- I, okay. So for example, the very first day I went, mm-hmm. um, I don't know anybody. You're nervous. I'm alone. Yeah, I'm nervous. I know that there's not like a a beginner course where they practice you on ponies. Like they're just going to put you on a bull. They put you on a real right. bull. Yeah. And and so I go and I'm meeting all these cowboys and they all know each other because they go all over the state. You know, to these little pounds to do rodeos together so they'll know everybody and they're looking at me like you know who the hell are you and uh there was a guy there who i don't remember his his name but let's let's say it was jerome or something okay and so jerome walks in everyone's like oh hey jerome they all go over to the arena to like congratulate him it was their first or not congratulate him like kind of greet him their first time seeing him in um a couple of weeks because he broke his neck. Oh no. <laughs> so he's got a neck brace on. So my first day, Jerome's like, hey man, <laughs> dude's with walking in with a neck brace. brace on. Oh. Yeah. And he, he casually mentioned, like, you know, oh, Doc said, you know, uh, a little bit this way, a little bit that way. I could have been paralyzed. But hey, you know, I'll be back in a couple months. What? And sure enough, you know, I got to see him ride a bull a few months later, but but I, I knew that I would have regretted it, so I stuck with it. But our guest today knows a lot more about rodeo and certainly a lot more about successful rodeo than I do. Zach Aaron, a former two-time Saddle Bronc riding champion, transformed the lessons he learned in the rodeo arena into a successful 20-year career in corporate and entrepreneurial leadership, building teams, developing leaders, and helping companies thrive. Today, he's a professionally trained storyteller and speaker who coaches business owners on the wild ride of resonant creative leadership. His unique ability to see people's greatness and give straight talking truth inspires leaders to achieve their visions and rearrange, re-engage with the lost art of leadership. We talked with Zach about the art of leadership. We talked about how to understand and empathize with your employees without disempowering them, how to lead more successful teams. And we talked a little bit about riding Bronx. So stick around. You'll learn a little bit. I'm Sanger Smith. As always, I'm with my dad, Sean Smith, and this is Decidedly. So 
there, there's a little bit, there, there's something that I never quite understood as, um, you know, not like a real cowboy uh, as I was, but I, I've owned a few cowboy hats. There's some real cultural implications or maybe social implications of how you mold the, um, the, the top of the cowboy hat, right? The crown, the crown, the crown. Yeah. Yeah. How yeah. It's, it's there like a crease or four parts. Or yeah. Like there's a, like, there's like badges of honor. Like if you, if you like have a bull rider cowboy hat or a bronc rider cowboy hat, but you're just a field hand and you don't actually ride the Bronx, that's like a big no, no. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's unspoken, but like you said that I'm like, well, I don't think we'd ever, I never, that wasn't actually a rule. Like nobody said that, but it was an unspoken rule. Like absolutely. But it is a rule. There it is. It, is, one, it okay. is a rule, but I, I never heard somebody say it was. It was just like, oh, yeah, well, yeah of course. Why would you wear a cow? <laughs> like, if if you don't ride bulls, why would you do that? Or, like, it's just, it's kind of like a ba- badge of honor, I guess. And it just wasn't yeah. even a thing that, what is my the, mind. but how does that happen, right? Because they're so, they vary so much in style. Even the ones you have on the wall, they vary yeah. in style. What makes like a bull rider hat a bull rider hat versus a cattleman hat a cattleman hat versus, a, you know, I don't however know. it goes? I don't know. But <laughs> I, I have no clue. It, if you look throughout history of cowboys, it's like a, it's just like a fashion statement, just like anything else. If you look, the the shapes of the hats have changed um, mm. throughout. And you, so, ever, you ever seen those guys who wear cowboy hats, but they don't wear all of the appropriate attire with it? They'll have like a uh, like a businessman cowboy like hat and, and shorts or something, or yeah. Like, yeah. you know, or you know, well, pants I, with pleats. I grew up in Nebraska, and so I saw a lot of guys wearing cowboy hats with jean shorts and white socks pulled up to their knees in, you know, the <laughs> farmer. It's like, like, it's like those guys at the airport that just yeah. buy the straw cowboy hat, and, you know, they're walking got it at the DFW. gift shop. Yeah, they yeah. got it at the gift shop. Yeah, right. <laughs> so how did you, how did you, you grew up in Nebraska. Did you, did you start riding uh, rodeos at a young yeah. age? Well, I was 11, and I was team roping in county fair rodeos. And growing up, I wasn't a real cowboy though. Like I didn't grow up on a ranch. I worked in my mom and dad's grocery store. So they owned Aaron's family food, small town, 800 people. And I didn't even really want to do it. Like my mom was really into horses. And so she'd take me to these rodeos. And one Saturday I saw a friend of mine climb on the back of a, 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 a giant Clydesdale horse, you know, like the Budweiser commercials. So yeah, he, yeah. he he climbs in the chute, he drops down on this this giant horse, and he nods his head, and you know the gate flies open, and Travis rides that horse all the way to the buzzer. Crowds applauding, and I'm like tapping my mom on the shoulder, like, "Mom, can I do that? Like, that's what that looks fun." And so she gets uh, Travis's dad, Bruce Dirty, to train me. And so that first Saturday, I get on the back of one of those Bronx, I get thrown in the ground just over and over of course. and over again. Uh, Bruce came to me. Uh, and he's like, Zach, you need to stop trying so damn hard. You need to learn to slow down and stay in the process. Well, two years go by. Two years. I, I did nothing but hit the ground. I broke my hand, ankle, and collarbone. Probably had several concussions. That wasn't a thing back then. We didn't pay attention, but pretty sure I had a few of those. And <laughs> Run um, some dirt on it. You'll be right. right. <laughs> that was ex- exactly. Yeah. Um, two years. And I hadn't made it to the eight-second buzzer. And now I'm 16 years old. We're at another rodeo. And I'll I'll never forget it. Thunderstruck. You know that song A C D C Thunderstruck? Oh yeah. It's sure. playing in the background and I've got my boots, chaps, spurs on, and I'm about ready to climb over the back of the chute and it's my turn to go next. And you know, I nod my head and that gate flies open and it just like something clicked. Everything was happening in slow motion. Before I know it, I hear the buzzer, the crowds roaring you know and, and i'm on my feet now and i just remember the, the only thing i really remember other than the slow motion i look over in the grandstands and my mom uh, my mom was like the only person standing with her hands raised above her head just screaming like you know like a mom would and <laughs> i went on from that point on i went on to become two-time state champion i earned a full ride scholarship to uh, fort scott community college uh, it's just south of kansas city and yeah so it, that's that's a that's a story that I didn't share with a lot of people. I was vice president of sales. I did a lot of leadership stuff, but it wasn't until probably three years ago that I really started sharing that story because I just didn't feel like it resonated or, or was relevant to the business world. Finding out it, it it is, but 
that's that's uh, how it all started. Well, you said something interesting in that in, in the advice that you got was to slow down and sort of engage in the process. How do you how do you do that? And you and you said that the first time you broke the second buzzer, it was going in slow motion. Is there a way to purposefully make that process slow down or make it feel like it slowed down? You know, just yeah, that was a good question. It. You know, I was trying so damn hard, like I really was, and. So if you really think about it, like you're not going to out try a 2000 pound wild animal. That's these, this bronc is going to is stronger than you. So I can't control the outcome. Like I had to learn to, to go with it. I couldn't fight it. And that was, that was the process. I had to hit the ground enough times to finally just like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm in this thing. I'm going to, I'm going to be in the moment and trust the process. It, it happened. It clicked. And, and, and once it clicked, it was like a feeling I got in the, my body. And from that point on, I just, I guess I could trust myself and I knew I, I knew I had it. Yeah. It's probably not. And I guess it can't be because you, I mean, you put it in good, good perspective. You know, you're, you're basically competing against a 2000 pound animal. You're not going to out muscle them. No, right? you're not going to just hold on out of sheer strength. You've got to go with the flow. Yeah. Well, and for years, that's what I was trying to do. Like I was just trying so hard. And, you know, today I, I work with a lot of entrepreneurs, entrepreneurial leaders, and there comes a point where that sheer willpower and grit, you know, what got you here won't get you there. Um, and there is this letting go and letting the team do more. Um, that's, that's the, that's what I'm teaching a lot of my clients now is like bringing this, this, these lessons from the rodeo arena into the a leadership context because what i believe um i believe leadership is an art i think we've over scienced it um focused on behaviors and tactics and personality assessments and we've lost the art of leadership it's not about what you do or how you do it it's about who you're being and it's a wild ride it is a wild ride but we need to learn to embrace that and and fall in love with the journey again and and that's what I now have been able to help my clients do is, yeah, embrace the wild ride of what I call resonant creative leadership. Tell me more about resonant creative leadership. So what I've seen in so many of the leaders, so over the last 15 years, I've gotten to work with a lot of great leaders and companies, and there's this overemphasis on um, what they believe leadership is supposed to look like. And they're, they spend all their energy trying to please everyone around them, living up to some made-up expectation. And to me, that's not leadership. It's not about proving yourself to others. It's about expressing who you are. And so resonant creative leadership, resonant in that what you do and how you do it aligns with who you are. Creative, and then it's, it's an expression towards possibility and opportunity and growth. And then leadership, it's just simply getting people with you on that journey. And so seeing leadership more as an artistic expression is, is what I help leaders do. Because if you reflect on, and if, if those listening, like if you reflect on the leaders that you most admire in your life, I, me, when I do that, these leaders, they're not only getting the highest results, it's that they almost make it look effortless. It just comes naturally for them. It's because they're coming from a place of resonant creative leadership. Leadership to them isn't something they do to people. They, they just are being that. It's an expression of who they are. They have a vision and, and they're bringing it to life. So when, when you look at that and you, you look at the, the resonant component of that, and it's a it's an aspect of being. You've got to know who you are, as you said. How do you get someone to a point where they understand who they are, they know yeah. who they are, so that they are allowing themselves to have that true self come forward? You know, the first thing that I I work with my clients on is it's around getting a vision for their life and their business. But not like, well, what should I do? What are, what's, what's the guy across the street doing? Oh, I should, I could do better than that. And not from a competitive place necessarily, but from a, what would light you up? What would you love to do? And if you, the fullest expression of that, what would that look like? Let's turn that into a vision. 
And then like, just like riding Bronx, like when you're behind the shoots, like K there's chaos all around you. The, the shoot gates are banging the shoot boss. There's a guy behind you yelling at you, like, hurry up, get in, get out. Cause we got a show to put on here for these people. Um, and I had to learn to keep all my focus and energy on a spot on the, sh the shoulders, the horse's shoulder. There's a spot where the neck and the shoulder connect. It's a spot about this big. If I kept all my eyes on that point, everything else just disappeared. And it's this keeping the eyes on, on the bronc. And so when I'm teaching with, I'm working with entrepreneurs, it's like, what is the vision? And then keeping all your attention on the vision. Because in rodeo, the tension came from the bronc. It, the t like, again, I couldn't, I wasn't, there wasn't a lot of conflict with the bronc. Like I wasn't gonna get into a battle and think I was gonna win that fight, but there was tension. Like I had to stay in that tension and stay with that bronc for eight seconds. And where's tension come from in the business is the vision. The bigger the vision, the more tension there is because current reality. So we stand in this moment, current reality. And then out there in the future is this big vision. There's tension. And that tension has to resolve itself. It has to resolve itself. And the more tension you have, the more it's going to want to pull you into it if you leave the tension there. But far too often, we don't allow the tension to be there. We lower our, our expectations. We lower the vision and we lose tension around our vision. And so what I teach these leaders to do is like, what are you committed to really? What are you committed to? Or if you're committed to your vision and you keep that thing where it's at, you're going to let the tension pull you into it. Consistent action just towards that vision. And, and that's the first thing. Like it, it's bringing that in alignment, knowing what you want and then not apologizing for it. And then allowing yourself to stay in the discomfort and the tension of creating it, that creative tension. Yeah. I, I think if you have a vision that is, is magnetic, right? It, it's, it's pulling you towards that vision and you're allowing yourself to become that vision. In essence, the, the energy burn diminishes. Like you, you can't get exhausted if you're living that vision. I, I remember there was a, uh, there was a long hike I went on a few years back and about three weeks into the hike, I had this feeling and it was this real feeling. I'm just hiking one day. And I said, I'm, I'm no longer just some guy who's hiking. This is what I do. Like I am, I am a hiker. I'm not a guy who's hiking. I'm a hiker. And, and it was really interesting. It's like saying, you know, rather than just going out and you, you run in the morning, you're a runner or, you know, you, you become that. And the amount of energy consumption I felt dropped away. I, I felt this, I could do this all day long. I could walk all day long. And so I think you're right in that there's this correlation or connection rather to energy consumption and alignment with vision that is, that's so important when you're, when yeah. you're leading. Yeah. Just this morning, I was talking to a client about this very thing and there's some things for her that were really not working in the business. And we were talking about this concept that comes from Ben Hardy, 10 X is easier than two X. And we were, she was, we were focusing so much on the incremental improvement. But then as, as I asked her, I'm like, well, what do you really want? And, and, and then, then the vision came out, the real desire came out, which was night and day. Like she even said, like, my business isn't even going to be the same business if I were to, if I were to create that. And it's like, well, then why are we spending all this time and energy trying to fix all this stuff that isn't even going to be there? And, and, and as immediately her energy changed because we were no longer trying to fix something that she didn't even really want in the first place. And the second we started aligning it with what she actually desired, all the energy came like now it's worth it now. Yeah. Stress, tension. Cool. Because I'm feeling progress towards what I ultimately want. Like, I think what we ultimately want in our businesses is feeling progress towards that vision. And you have to be willing to hold it and keep it there and commit to it and not compromise it. That's where it, the progress comes. It seems to me the best visions never are able to be fully realized. Right. If we're, if we're setting an appropriate vision for our business, it's something that is a perpetual pursuit. 
it, it's yeah. not a goal that m- might take us three years to it's achieve. It's not a smart goal. Yeah, yeah, it can't be a smart goal. Yeah. If it is a smart goal, then it, it's not the biggest thing that we could imagine. You know, there's. I agree, and I I have a different perspective too. Is um, sometimes those in, infinite games that we'll call them, those visions that never have, you'll never achieve them. I believe sometimes those can feel safe. That that there's like this. Well, there's no real measuring stick on whether I'm there or not, and so it's it's something to really always keep out in front of me. I think there's power in having a vision that is very quantitative, um, but very big, 10 years, 20 years out. So for example, I'm just going to use me. I, for the longest time, I just, I dreamed of being a coach. I was a vice president of sales for a logistics company and 12 years I was leading teams. And then over a a glass of bourbon, I'm basically told that I'm not on the leadership team anymore. And Michael, this guy that came in 12 months, just 12 months ago, he's now vice president of sales. I'm demoted down to sales guy. And I, later on, I was told by the guy that came in to replace me, he said, you're a good soldier, but that's not leadership. And that's when I started dream, like, like, what do I really want? Cause I don't really want to, I want to be a coach. And so I set off, I started my coaching business, but here recently I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm doing this again. And I think a lot of business owners, they set out to achieve their vision. They, then they, now they have it. I just want to, I want to be able to be profitable and be able to pay myself this type of income. And, and then they have that. And then it's, we get so worried about holding on to it and it's time to keep getting it. But if you have a big vision 20 years out, you have room to play. And so just in the last year, I set a goal for myself and I wrote down 1 million resonant creative leaders. One like that's, that's out of this world for me, like it, and all kinds of discomfort came up and that showed me what I have to work on. Like, Oh, there's, that's what I need to address. If I'm, and it only, it only came about because I set that huge vision that was quantitative that I actually could see if I wanted to, like I could see it. And now I don't see myself as a coach. I see something much bigger to live into. And so I think the quantitativeness makes it real and some people can it, it, it can also be uncomfortable but there's so that, power. that's sort of like the, the michael collins you know the big huge audacious goal of just sort of setting that out there something yeah. that has that is far enough out there that is makes it achievable you've got about a 50 50 chance of achieving it but it's that it's that big compelling magnetic magnetic goal right when you look at we were talking uh, earlier about looking at scaling up this was, you know, yeah, I saw I saw a, a post of yours, and I want I wanted to ask you about. It. Yeah. So you you posted on Instagram, um, if you were one hundred percent committed to ten xing your business, what's the scariest thing that you would have to do, or something along those lines? Yeah. And um, I didn't have an answer immediately, but my first question for you was, what are you trying to achieve when you ask a question like that to a client? The, the Joseph Campbell quote comes to mind that the cave you fear the most holds the treasure you seek. And I work with so many business owners. And for example, they might have a member on their team that they just they know they're not the right fit for the team. Um, but they tolerate this person for years because they're afraid of letting them go because we need them, you know, and, and, and they're they're scared of what it would be like without them. And could I find somebody better or could it get worse? And. Um, it's through those tough conversations, those things that we're avoiding oftentimes in our business where your greatest opportunity is. So if you're a business owner, ask, you're like, what am I avoiding? What am I tolerating? And h- how long have I been tolerating it? Oftentimes those things, it would, the reason you've been tolerating is because it's more comfortable to have it than not have it. Like there's something you're afraid to be with. There's a possibility that you're afraid might happen if you were to to do what you believe is the right thing. And so you, we just stay on this path. So this idea of what scares you, oftentimes, you know, like resistance is the way, Ob- the obstacle is the way, like resistance and where you're experiencing the most resistance oftentimes is an indicator of exactly the opportunity that's gonna make the biggest difference in your business and in your life. So the things that I don't wanna do are the things that I need to go do right now. 
not that you don't want to do them. There's some, there's some real, like, am I somebody that could even do that? Is that really possible? Or, or like, there's some, there's more fear. There's this insecurities or imposter syndrome or something that's like, am I really that good? Could I really do that? Um, it's not about, sometimes you, you, I don't encourage people to, to do what they don't want to do. I actually want you to listen to like, what do you really want to do? Like, what's your real desire? What's your real dream? Yeah. You're not doing it yet because there's something there that's scares, scares you. you. That might mean you have to let go of a core piece of your business. Like, right. Or, or there's something that, well, I want to, I want to be this type of business, but that would mean I would have to stop doing this. And that scares the hell out of me. And so I keep doing what I don't want to do. So that it's, yeah. it's actually the opposite. What do you really want to do? What do you really desire? Like, let's do what you love. What is telling you that you can't do what you love? Now we're getting somewhere. There's probably some real fears or insecurities or, or beliefs, limiting beliefs that are telling you that, well, success is hard work. I, you know, that would, that would be, that would be, um, childish in me to just do what I love. But I, I believe there's, there's gold there if we allow ourselves to, to stay with that. Yeah. You know, it's, I, I like that quote. The, I, I had a business owner friend of mine and every time I would meet with her, she would talk about how she didn't have time. I don't have enough time. I'm swamped. I can't, I wish there, you know, there's not enough hours in the day. And, she was just stressed all the time. And I said, why don't we spend some time looking at how you can work less, how you can take time away from your business, uh, hire the right people, build the right systems, you know, have the right you know, vendor relationships, those types of things. And every time I brought it up, she would just, she would just reject it. It, it was this fearful approach. Like you were talking about, she would just, Oh, I can't, I can't do that. I, you know, I, I she couldn't even imagine it. You know, it was sort of 10 xing her business to her. Um, and at the time I was taking about 13 weeks off from my business every year. And, you know, so I'm like, you know, if I were you, I, maybe you ought to ask me a question. <laughs> right. <laughs> I know what I'm talking yeah. about. Here. <laughs> but I, I love that quote that, uh, you know, the cave you fear the most holds the treasure you seek is that a lot of times it's, it's those things that we don't want to do that we're fearful of doing, whether it's going out and writing a book or starting a coaching business or, or scaling up your business in such a way that it's, you know, huge. The number one thing I see business owners, the business owners that I've worked with and the leaders is they do want to scale. They want to scale. They want, I don't, I don't know. I find that a lot of people are really looking for a sense of peace and calm and contentment. And like the business is just kind of very chaotic and creating a lot of stress for them. And they just want that to quiet down They're They're even questioning, like, do I even want to keep growing? Cause like more people, more sales, more stress. And what I've noticed is, you know, a question I love asking these leaders is how are you, how are you contributing to this thing you say you don't want this business that is draining you? How are you contributing to that? And oftentimes there is this not letting go, not letting the team take more on. And then a lot of leaders, we fall into this trap of, um, we call it servant leadership, but it's, it's not, we, we, uh, we've mistaken caring for people with coddling them and kind of being a caretaker instead of being a caring leader. I, uh, I see this, we, we, we rush in to rescue and fix fix things instead of allowing people to be responsible. I, uh, when I was 11, I told you guys, right. I was doing the team roping thing. My mm. mom met, uh, Bruce for the first time and he invited me to his ranch for a week. He was going to teach me how to team rope. And I remember that night, my mom's like, I, I met Bruce and he, he's going to teach you how to team rope. You're going to, I'm going to take you to his ranch next Saturday. And that day comes and my mom drops me off and she leaves and I'm in the kitchen and I just finished up a bite to eat. And here comes Bruce. All right, go out there, saddle up your horse, meet me in the arena in 15 minutes. We're going to start practice. So I'm like, cool. And I'm walking to the barn to get my horse, Joe. I'm like, wait a minute. I, I, I've never saddled my horse before. Like I've seen others people saddle their horse, but I've, I don't know how to 
Like my mom always sat on my horse. So I get Joe and I, I, I'm like, well, Bruce isn't going to, I'm not going to ask him. Like, I don't want him to know that, you know? And so I tie Joe up to the horse trailer and I grab the saddle and the thing weighs about as much as I do. And I, like, like <laughs> okay. I, I hoist it up there and it gets about above my chest and I can't, even, I'm like, this is not going to, but I was determined and I, I found a, a feed bucket under the horse trailer and I flipped, made a stool out of it and I kind of got a running start, jumped up, plopped that saddle down and cinched it up and I got on the back of my horse and I rode into the arena, but it was something was different. Like I was riding taller in the saddle. And what I learned is you don't really feel like a, a real cowboy until you saddled your own horse. And that's what these leaders, this is what we need to be doing as leaders is creating an environment where everyone saddles their own horse, where there's just an expectation where um, we just let people saddle their own horses because that day I grew up like that was a defining moment in my life. And I believe as leaders, we can give those gifts to our employees and our team members when we start to see them as powerful and kind of get out of their way and stop rescuing and helping them so much. Let them struggle because that's where the growth comes. What does it look like when leaders are coddling their employees too much? Well, a story I often share like I, I, I'm in a lot of conference rooms working with leadership teams. They bring me in to just to kind of call out the elephants in the room and, and get the get people communicating again. And oftentimes when that happens, somebody inevitably will will break down in tears. Like they like there will be a dam that breaks and they're they're in it. The emotions are flowing. And as soon as the tears come, what what do I see? I see the leader quickly go looking for the box of tissues. He hands that person a box of tissues and, and he goes on and tells them, it's going to be okay. Um, what can we do to help you? Maybe we, maybe I can take some of your customers for a while and, and maybe just, just slow down, take a break. We rescue them. We try to solve their issue. And I'm sitting in there in the room as the coach and I'm like, God, like, dang it. Like, don't do that. Because when, when their tears are flowing, like, Breakthroughs come from breakdown. So as a coach, I'm like, oh my God, like just, if you would have just let that person stay in their discomfort a little bit longer, there was an opportunity right then and there to teach them how to saddle their own horse. But instead you reach for the box of tissues and are told it was going to be okay. And, and you started taking away the pressure. And so this is how we, we, we lose sight of the fact that the person on the other side of the conference table, they are powerful. They are responsible. And our job as leaders, I believe, is to help them see themselves as powerful. And so keep the responsibility, keep the ownership with that person. And what that looks like is when they're in that, ask them. Well, first of all, I acknowledge and validate. You know what? It's understandable that you're feeling exhausted right now, considering you're working 70 hours a week traveling and you missed your daughter's recital last week. You know, totally understand that you're, that, that you're feeling burnout. Just acknowledge and validate because as soon as you just share with, show them that you've been listening, inevitably their whole body language just kind of just does a, ah, yeah, it has been hard. Now asking them a powerful question like, well, what, what do you need to be different so that you can get back to being your best? I've seen you at your best. What do you need right now that you're not getting? And like keeping them responsible for creating their own solution. That's what we, we seldom do as leaders and we need to get back to because the more we rescue people and jump in and ask them if we can help them, we're communicating to them as someone who needs our help. And that's just not true. 99% of the time, it's not true. Yeah. Well, and, what you're saying is, re uh, man, that's resonating a lot. Like I can look back on my career as a leader and identify several times where I've done that to people where I've unintentionally disempowered them by assuming that they need me to save them from whatever problem is causing them frustration or, um, you know, any number of bad feelings in that moment. How do I balance that though with a, the feeling of, Hey, I, I want, this is, this is what's going through my head if an employee is crying to me about how they're frustrated, right? Is, well, I, immediately believe their assessment of the situation. <laughs> if oh, they yeah. are crying because they're overworked, I immediately believe it. 
And the reason I immediately believe it is because that seems a better outcome than, or a better reflection of the business I've set up in my relationship with this person than for me to immediately discount it, discount it. Right? No, you're not overworked. Yeah. If I, <laughs> yeah. I, one, I want them to feel like I hear them. So I don't, I don't want to be an over demanding, uh, employer or leader. Um, I, I believe, I believe they're competent and powerful, strong people. So if they are breaking down saying, Hey, I'm overworked, I believe that versus, versus me thinking, okay, I've hired this whining, complaining, yeah, incompetent idiot who's going to break down anytime they have any type of real resistance. Right. Yeah. So I love that you saw that because I am not um, seeing past the story. I'm, I believe them too. Uh, yeah, I believe that you are overworked. Like if you're coming with the emotions and like you're you're like, yeah, agree. This this really doesn't look like it's working for you. This current approach to how you're approaching the job. Now, this sounds cold, but um, the second I jump in to rescue them, that's a kind of a dramatic word, but we come in. It's it's the um, I can't think of the guy's name, the drama triangle, though, like whenever you rescue somebody, you automatically put them whether they want to be there or not. You put them in a victim position. You just do. Yeah. And so what I'm suggesting is. um. Yeah, this is serious. This really isn't working. This is causing, this is real pain that they're in. And they are powerful to create a way out of it, though. And that's our job as leaders. Is And, and I'm also saying it's not just to go through the motions and be like, you know, and, and give them a little pat on the back. And I believe in you and you can do this. No, it's like, listen for how might you be contributing to that overwhelm. But you're you're coming from a place of listening they're helping them solve their own challenge. But then wherever you see the organization or the way in which we're doing things might be creating that you're willing to say, what if we change that? But what you're not doing is quickly jump into the assumption of like, Oh, they're overwhelmed. They need my help here. Let me just take that off your plate and we can do yeah. this. And just, yeah. why don't, why don't you just slow down for a while? Like, yeah, if I do that enough, I'm going to be the one crying in the break room. And that's, that's my client. Then they, then they're like, it's like, well, you created that. You keep, you keep, you're not keeping the responsibility with your team. You keep taking it away from them. And, and nobody wins when that happens. It just, yeah, I think there's two questions that help when you get to that point, when you're, when you're dealing with something like that. One is uh, that we, you know, we, remember we talked with Michael Sherlock on the podcast uh, sometime back. And the question that we learned from, from Michael was, just tell me more about that. In other words, giving that person space to explain in this example, you know, why they felt overworked or whatever it is and, and learning more about that. And I had a conversation with Kathy Colby a few months ago, founded the, you know, the Colby corporation. Mm -hmm. And she said her, her favorite question is what would you like to see happen? Oh yeah. Just in other words, you get to that point and just say, what would you like to see happen? Giving them that power to say, well, how do you see? Because it might, solving? yeah, they might not say less work. Well, and, and it doesn't mean that I have to agree with whatever they say, right? And th I might, they might say, well, I'd like to work half time. And then, you know, you can say, well, you know, tell me how that would work, right? And, you know, explain to me how I would do that, right? You know, using sort of the Chris Voss, you know, uh, never split the difference type approach. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, the I think listening and empathetic listening is a huge part of getting somebody out of that funk, but also giving them the power to fix it. So. Yeah. And it's uncomfortable for us to do that. Um, oftentimes we can be just as uncomfortable, if not more uncomfortable watching somebody suffering. I think we're, we are compassionate leaders. We, we, we do care so much for people that, we just can't stand them struggling. And so we want to help them. We just, oh, I just want to help you. Um, but I like to challenge the status quo. It's like, if you truly want to serve and be that servant leader, like if you look at the, like Google, the definition of servant leadership, I don't have it memorized, but the essence of servant leadership is leading in a way that creates leaders, that leads in a way that creates responsibility in others. Nowhere in servant leadership does it say we walk around and, carry people and, and, and like we, we, we help them grow up in a, in a very loving way. 
that's what I love most about servant leadership. But I think so many of us have have lost sight of the tr- true essence of what it means to serve somebody in that way as a leader. Is there a, um, a story or an example of one of your clients that embodied servant leadership in a way that you think is most appropriate? Yeah. You know, this is a, a, a client I work with. It's a leadership team. We're in the room and Anthony, he, he we, we just started the meeting and he shares with the whole team, we're missing our sales numbers and it's looking like we're not going to hit this month either. And they didn't even let him finish this sentence. And the whole team was like all about like, well, this is what we need to do to solve it. You know, and they were just, everybody was throwing in their two cents, just kind of arguing, going back and forth. And I'm just sitting there and I look over at Anthony. Anthony's just kind of staring down at his notes and I interrupt him. I go, guys, let's, why don't we ask Anthony what he thinks? I mean, he, he leads the sales team. And so everybody looks to Anthony and Anthony's just quiet. And then he looks up at us. He holds his finger up. He's like, one second, I'm quiet because I'm thinking. And not long after that, he looks at the team. He's like, here's the deal. This is the issue. And this is what I'm doing to solve it. And this is the next step. And everybody's like, we were just moving on. We were just moving on. Like they were like, cool, you got it. But before that, you would have thought like the sky was falling. And it reminded me of the scene. Have you guys seen the show Breaking Bad? Sure. Yes. Sure. Remember that show? Um, Walt, he has, it's the first season. He has cancer, but he's been hiding. He hasn't told his family. Well, now they all know it and they're in his living room and he's sitting there and they're all sitting there and they're all arguing in, in, about what Walt should do about his situation. Like arguing about it. You know, he should get this treatment. He should get a second opinion. And Walt's just sitting there. And then it, eventually you see Walt get out of his chair. He walks across the room and he grabs this pillow out of his wife's lap. And now he's standing in the middle of the room with this pillow. And he's like, I got the talking pillow now. It's my turn to talk. And that's what happens in most leadership contexts is our employees, they are not going to... S- get up in the middle of the meeting and grab the talking pillow unless you create the space for them to do that. And so to answer your question, that's the best thing that came to my mind. It's like, we have to slow down and give people space. Two things like the, the VP of sales, Anthony, he was quiet because he was thinking. And I remember telling the team laughing afterwards, we were reflecting on what just happened there. And I'm kind of like, isn't that what we want? People thinking and, 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 we that sometimes looks like silence and so being willing to just create some space for people to to think because sometimes there's just this rush i've got to figure out something to say because there's five other people that think they know what to do and so we're just all trying to rushing to solve something and we're not really slowing down and and actually thinking and so it's creating the space and the environment for people to to own own the solution one of the things I wanted to ask you, when, when you look at going, going back to bronc riding, when you're looking at bronc riding, the, the entity that is trying to defeat you is, is that 2,000 pound horse sitting beneath you. What do you think is the entity that's trying to defeat leaders? What are they, what are they fighting against? Mm. You know, there's this, uh, you're making me think of, so I, uh, I did a keynote in May and in preparing for the keynote, I found this statistic, uh, Deloitte did a study and it found that 76% of employees say they feel burnout by their work. A lot of us have heard that quote, but there was another study done kind of simultaneously. 70% of our executives and entrepreneurial leaders have said they've seriously considered quitting. And so there's just this, wow. this this current of like, well, who's leading then if that's the case? Right. And, and like, so we got to get back to being responsible and, and, and creating more of what we want in our life. And so what is, what is trying to take out leaders? I think it's back to they're tr- We're trying to live up to the standards. The world says leadership should be. And I love, I love, 
what Ralph Waldo Emerson says about leadership. It, he didn't necessarily say it about leadership, but I'm making it about leadership. He said, right. he said that um, to be yourself in a world that's trying to make you somebody else, that's the greatest accomplishment. So we live in a world that is telling us 76% of your employees are burnt out. You need to do something about it, you know? And, and so we're like, and then we, we don't even, we want to quit. And, and the thing with that is this, 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 even, even a lot of leadership experts are talking about this idea of, I heard a, a, a well-known author, leadership management consultant. He said the days in this post pandemic world, the days of fast growth are gone and we need to get back to taking care of our people. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, I get like, I get the sentiment, but I'm like, I don't think it's our job as leaders to quote unquote, take care of people. Now you could easily misinterpret that. And I hope listen for insight, not agreement, but when we make it about taking care of people back to the vision, we lose sight of the vision. Now we're living in a way that, Oh, we're here to, we got to make sure this is a good place to work. And our, our college campuses are teaching students to go find a company that's going to take care of you. And then HR is creating all the entitlements to get try, people to try to come work for us. There's little to no talk about the vi vision. And deep down, I don't think we're as burnt out as we say we are. I think we're bored. I think a lot of people are bored. They're, they're over obligated living and doing stuff that they think they should be doing. That's employees and that's leaders. And they're not doing what they really can be doing. And that is sucking the life. And that's what leads to burnout. Boredom leads to burnout. I think like, I don't know, just play with that as a, as a possibility. Well, yeah. I mean, it leads to a lot of things. I read a statistic the other day that was talking about, it was, it was talking about addiction, you know, cocaine addiction, things like that. And they had fed cocaine to rats and the rats would eat as much cocaine as was provided until they just overdosed on yeah. the, on the cocaine, which wasn't surprising. What was surprising was that that didn't happen if they gave the rats anything else to do mm. a, a wheel, a toy, other rats, something else, they didn't do it. And, it. and it really made me realize that we've got to have this sense of purpose, you know, for ourselves as leaders, but also that people in our organization have to have a sense of purpose. They have to have something that they're doing. Otherwise negative influences flow in. Um, something that I teach uh, the companies I work with is this is put people in the arena, put people in the arena. Um, cause I remember asking my coach, like, how do I, like I was hitting the ground over and over and over again for two years. Like I was not getting this. And I remember like, how do I get better at this? Cause like, and he just, to he told me, he's like, you just got to keep putting yourself back in that arena. Like you get bucked up. You just got to get back on and keep going. You'll get better every time you go back in that arena. And I believe in business, we got to keep putting people in the arena that if you want to retain great people, we need to demand more of them, like, cause they're not burnt out, they're bored. And so we need to ask more of them because I don't know about you, but I wanted to be put in the arena. I, I still do like I crave it. And the number one way for people to experience their own growth is, well, how do people grow through real world challenging experiences? Yeah. And give them the autonomy yeah. when they're in the arena. Right. And so no, you're not riding on the back of the horse with them, holding them tight. Right. That that goes back to this. Everyone saddles their own horse. Exactly. I'm, I'm hoping that coach had some technical suggestion for you of what to do. Other than just, <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep on going. Just, Zach. just keep back going up there, boy. <laughs> you know, it was a little more of that, honestly. Um, uh, well, okay. Uh, he was a tough guy. Uh, and it was a little bit like just rub some dirt on it. I remember, though. I, it, I felt so like ashamed of myself, but he's like, he's like, Zach, you would fall off a pony. Like he, 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 you know, like the horse shows 4 H. like they're just these horses that trot yeah. around, little kids right. ride them. He basically was saying like, Zach, you'd get bucked off a kid's pony the way you're going about this. And he proved it to me. He's like, I'm going to bring in, he called him old paint. It was this calm, gentle, uh, black and white spotted horse old horse and I got in the shoot on this horse and the horse would trot out and, and I would fall off 
And I'm like, what the <laughs> hell? Like, I ride horses. I've been riding horses since I was eight years old, but for some reason, I put this bronc saddle on. And I, and so there's a part of him, I think he saw, like, this isn't a technical thing. You're so in your head, you're trying so hard that you just need to, at some point, just keep getting back on until it, what do you, what until do you, you kind of give up. Was? I mean, there had to have been some sort of mental breakthrough yeah. that caused you to get that to slow down for you and stay on. What do I think the breakthrough was? I think it was a combination of, if I were really to think, there was like anything. I don't, I'm the type of guy that wants something so bad that sometimes I'm on the, I'm, I'm on the floor, like crying out to God, like, why can't I have this? Or why can't I figure this out? Right. And, and like tears and pain. And, and so there was moments like, like it's been two years, like I know I can do this. And I think there was a moment of just like, like, letting that go and so that's like maybe more of the psychological stuff but then i also think back the horse i got on that day it was just perfect the way they say like a great bronc ride is like sitting in a rocking chair well this horse just kind of like the way he, he kicked it just it like put my body in the right position a couple times and it just it, it was just like once i found it i was like oh there it is and it, my body knew my body knew then what to do at once I felt it for the first yeah. time, if that makes sense. It, it does. What, what do you, what would you say would be your final tip on decision-making yeah. for business leaders and uh, business owners? I believe we need to get out of our heads and learn to trust our instincts more. Um, we spend so much time and energy trying to figure out the right answer when we, when we need to get back to listen to what do we des- what what is the result we want to see and and stop debating well is that possible can i do that is that the right thing to do because if we can always come back to what's the result i want to see here it won't it will never lead us astray. Like, and so, and then believing that we are somebody that can create that result. And so that's more of a, a feeling in your body. And it's, it's not, it's, it's not an intellectual exercise because nine times out of 10, the leaders I work with, they already know what the next step is. They just do, but they're trying to overanalyze it, overthink it. And if they would just trust themselves, you know, I think a Maverick and the, the newest Top Gun movie, like, don't think, just do like, just, just play play full out and and you'd be amazed what happens thanks so much for being here zach where can people connect with you and the work that you're doing yeah so um the best way to stay in touch with me is i i have a daily email i call it the eight second coach it's short it's eight seconds or less i send a question every morning a question to amplify your leadership a question to help you think deeper around an area of your business or a relationship with a team member. And so that would be the best way um, for them to kind of get inside my head and and, and uh, kind of live into this different way of being that I've been describing in, in today's episode. And I can give you the link. It's uh, to, to sign up, zacharon.com forward slash daily question. And so they can sign up there. Awesome. Thanks so much, Zach. Thanks a lot, Zach. My takeaway from talking with Zach is that when we look at resisting things, we are using a lot of energy. And so you really have to examine what decisions you're making to resist certain things. And he, he, had, he had a lot to say about going with the flow and and not muscling things that you can't win against, like, you know, fighting a 2000 pound horse. And so just looking at, am I resisting something that I either can't control, have influence over, or do control. And if I look at the decisions I make, they're going to fall into those three categories. Things I control, things I influence, or things I don't control. And that if it's something I don't control, I shouldn't be fighting it. I shouldn't be resisting it. My energy should go to the things that I do control. My biggest takeaway is that leadership's an art, and we're losing the art of leadership. That resonated a lot with me as I talk with clients who are maybe seeking the exact right answer, or even I have a tendency to hey, when my employees say this, what should I say? And there's not a binary set of actions in 
human relationships that are going to lead me to success, right? I've got to learn the skill so I can practice the art. You just made a great decision to listen to this episode of Decidedly. Make another great decision and leave us a five-star review wherever you listen to podcasts. We appreciate your support. It helps others find our community and defeat bad decision-making in their own lives. For more daily decision-making insights, check us out at decidedlypodcast.com and on Facebook and Instagram at Decidedly Podcast. Thanks again for listening. I'm Sanger Smith, and this is Decidedly. Insights, advice, and comments provided by Sean Smith, Sanger Smith, and speakers identified as part of the Decidedly Podcast should not be considered recommendations. Speakers not identified as members of Decidedly are expressing their opinion, and their statements should not be construed as reflecting the views of the Decidedly team. This podcast is produced solely for informational purposes, not personalized advice.